From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo with the Wall Street Journal with Joe Sternberg and Kim Strassel. And we're talking about the lessons of the Afghan withdrawal a year later. One point I want to make about the withdrawal is that the choice at the time was not, as some have posited, that uh, between total withdrawal of the kind that we committed to and executed or a long-term major commitment. There was a plan that the Pentagon had offered, that the Pentagon supported, that the State Department supported, that nearly everybody in government supported except for the president, which was to keep 2,500 soldiers there, American soldiers, also an element of air power to back up the Afghan military and special forces. Afghan special forces was pretty good, and the belief was it was a doable mission, and it was, in fact, the, the sudden withdrawal of the U.S., particularly one night overnight, we just vanished from Bagram Air Force Base, which undermined the morale and confidence of the Afghan military and caused them to collapse. So it was an alternative mission, as the general in charge of Afghanistan has recently reinforced in comments related to the anniversary. Joe, stepping back some, what lessons do you draw from all of this? about not just the withdrawal, but the mission in Afghanistan? Well, one thing that we need to keep in mind here is that this was not just the U.S. and also not just the Afghan forces that were involved in this, because there was also a bigger issue to do with the presence of America's allies, particularly European allies there. And I think that that's sort of a way into thinking about some of the broader implications of this a, a year on, because I think that you know, there was this focus, I think, with in the Biden administration, as far as we can tell, on kind of what the president wanted for the U.S. presence there and for a U.S. domestic political audience and for his own preferences, you know, regarding all of that. But, you know, European allies also had a stake there and they got hung out to dry as a, a result of our hasty departure, which uh, many of them had not really been told about adequately before it happened. And so I think if you're kind of taking a, a step back to look at the I think that that cooperation was in many ways a great success. You know, this was the opportunity during the 20 years that we were in Afghanistan where we had really you know, worked on a mission that had been a big stretch for NATO at the time because much of this was done under the aegis of our NATO allies. And, it, you know, was creating an opportunity for us to continue working with those allies for a common purpose. And you have the sinking feeling over the past year that we've kind of thrown that advantage away, um, you know, without really thinking about the consequences. Okay. But Joe, let me push back on that in one sense. So if you look at NATO, which was the partner with the United States in Afghanistan, some people in the administration will come back and say, well, wait a minute here. You look what happened in Ukraine. NATO is back in business, baby. And in a big way, and more effective than ever. In fact, it's adding members. So Afghan withdrawal didn't do much harm to NATO. I think that, you know, there is a sense in which the European partners have realized after this event in Afghanistan that they kind of need to attend to their own affairs. And so I think that there is kind of this longer term problem that we're going to face where what they have been through in Afghanistan did raise questions about America's reliability as an ally. And so it's true that NATO has enjoyed a lot of successes as an alliance in terms of the situation in Ukraine. But you'll notice that one difficulty here in a lot of countries has been actual military commitment to Ukraine, You know, whether it's a willingness to sell arms or, or do training or, or that sort of thing. That was very slow to materialize. And I can't help wonder if part of that was because there was this lingering suspicion suspicion about the American commitment to the alliance and that we have had to overcome as the Ukraine situation has developed. Let's talk about a couple of other lessons about the war and the political impact. One lesson for me is shows again that you just cannot win an insurgency when the insurgents have a sanctuary in a nearby country. In Vietnam, it was North Vietnam and, of course, Cambodia and Laos. In Afghanistan, it was Pakistan nearby Pakistan. We never really reckoned with the double game that Pakistan was playing, claiming to be our ally at the same time, providing sanctuary in the North Frontier Territories to the Taliban and even to certain Taliban leaders, Samala Omar, Quetta, and other leaders in Quetta were ruthless enough with Pakistan to be able to stop that from being a sanctuary. 
And I wonder if, you know, to win a war like this, a war of insurgency, you just have to be more ruthless than the American people are willing to be when it comes to killing adversaries and going after adversaries like that in the kind of way that in our modern media world where you see the consequences in human terms so dramatically, we're just not willing to do it. And it makes you wonder whether we can undertake the kind of commitments overseas that we have in the past. Yeah, it's a really good point. And one thing I think that is worth noting is that we did learn a lot over 20 years, in particular, our armed forces about counterinsurgencies, putting a lot of things that have been theoretically talked about or used in small forms very much in action and modifying how as we went along, sometimes unsuccessfully and sometimes with better success. But on the broader point that you're making, Paul, yeah, the nature of conflict across the globe has changed. And sometimes when you look at a place like what's going on in Ukraine, that was sort of shocking itself too, in that it looked as if like, again, this almost old fashioned war, people in tanks and traditional conflict and mortars and, you know, the whole thing. But a lot of this now is about getting bad guys that are hiding in caves and places. And it does take a new level of ruthlessness. And I just think about the last 20 years, the periodic fights in the United States over using drones to go get these guys. We weren't even talking about putting American troops on the ground, boots on the ground, but the vicious debate internally, domestically about that form of warfare, much less, as you said, a more longstanding commitment where we actually have an actual presence. I worry about that too. And again, the Biden administration's entire argument for why we had to do this and the false premise was, well, we either had to put more people at risk on the ground or get out. I don't buy that. That wasn't really the case. But what that did signal is, that President Biden was, in fact, responding to American weariness with this conflict after just 20 years. And thank goodness we didn't necessarily have that attitude back when we were ensuring that Germany and Japan, after World War II, got back on track. And we still have presence in those places. But the American people have changed in that regard. And even though the world has become a more dangerous place, and that is very concerning. Joe, on that point, the skepticism about American involvement overseas has spread to the American right. And you see it in uh, Donald Trump's desire to withdraw American troops from much of the world. Some of the stories we've seen in the books that have appeared, memoirs about the Trump years talk about President Trump's desire to withdraw American troops from Germany, American troops from South Korea. And also, uh, in particular, I know this from reporting it in real time, with sources in the administration and in Congress that he wanted a declaration before he left office on January 20th that the troops would be out completely out of Afghanistan on his watch. And so in that sense, his personal criticism of Joe Biden on the withdrawal is somewhat hollow because I think Donald Trump, had he won a second term, would have done it as well. Now, one hopes he would have done it a lot uh, more effectively and efficiently and a lot less chaotically than Biden did, but he was going to pull those troops out too. Joe, last word. Yes, and I think that this is a big part of the the problem that the U.S. has grappled with for a long time and is going to continue here. Since the withdrawal from the world is a luxury that you don't really have if you are the world's superpowers, the U.S. is. So I think that the, the big thing that we have to be worried about with Afghanistan now is that as events develop in the second or the third or fourth year after the American withdrawal, I think that we really have to be watchful of, you know, any danger that we're going to get that lesson again in ways that could potentially be very dangerous for America. And I hope that people in Washington will be aware of that risk before we potentially get to that point. All right. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Joe. Thank you all for listening. We're back every day with another edition of Potomac Watch. You can send your comments and questions, cat calls, whatever, to uh, pwpodcast at wsj.com. And we look forward to hearing from you and look forward to having you with us again for the rest of the week in Potomac Watch.